In this video, we're going to talk about the little Nikon. This is the Nikon Z50. It's like a little baby Z6. So I have to be honest, probably like many of you, I have been waiting for Nikon to announce a more professional full frame camera than the Z6, Z7. But in the meantime, they've announced an APS-C or what they call DX size sensor, which is a little mini version of the stuff that we already got. So I wasn't sure how excited I was going to be about this. Nikon were gracious enough to send me one for review. I have to say, I am pleasantly surprised and impressed. Nikon has done an exceptional job of not taking a lot out. They give you a lot of camera for a very reasonable price point. And in a few areas, I think this actually exceeds what we're seeing with the Z6 and Z7. The autofocus is incredible on this. The low light performance is outstanding. And this is what I wanna get into in this little review. But first, I wanna talk about buying and selling used gear online. And I wanna give a shout out to our sponsor today who you may not have heard of yet, the awesome folks over at gearfocus.com. So if you want to offload gear that you're just not using anymore, traditionally we've only had a few options. You can trade it in for something new, which is quick and simple, but you only get 30 to 40 cents on the dollar. It's pretty hassle-free, but you just don't get any value out of the equipment that you already own. Of course, you could also use an auction site like eBay, but be prepared to pay a 10 to 13% commission. And if you take credit cards, there's another 2.9% plus 35 cents per transaction. Those fees actually come from the banks. There's no way around them. But I want to mention a new option which is GearFocus.com. GearFocus is an online marketplace for buying and selling photography and photo gear. Their commission fee is only 3.5% after an item has sold, which is the lowest that you're going to find anywhere. If you want to purchase equipment, they have an excellent support staff that approves all listings, and they know what red flags to look for, like poor descriptions or images not of the actual item that's being sold. GearFocus.com takes a great deal of pride in building a community of reputable buyers and sellers, and quite frankly, this is actually something that our industry has needed for a long time now. So head over to gearfocus.com by using the link in the description. I think you're going to find this to be an excellent resource for not only buying equipment, but also a way to offload equipment that you're no longer using. So check it out. And I want to give a special thanks to the folks at gearfocus.com for sponsoring an episode of The Art of Photography. So let's take a look at the Nikon Z50. Now the intention from Nikon was to design a camera that is a DX format or APS-C size sensor, which is smaller, but it brings over some of the same functionality and design aesthetic from the full frame cameras such as the Z6 and Z7. I think they did a really nice job on this. The first thing you're gonna notice is it does use the same Z mount. It is massive, it takes up most of the camera. However, this is cool because it gives you access to all of the Z series lenses as well as the FTZ adapter which gives you access to any DX or FX full frame F mount lens. The sensor in this camera is a 20.9 megapixel DX format backside illuminated CMOS. It features the XSpeed 6 image processor. It also handles U HD 4K as well as full HD video recording. The electronic viewfinder is a 0.39 inch 2.3 million dot OLED viewfinder with a 1.02x magnification. And we also have a 3.2 inch 1 million dot rear monitor that tilts 180 degrees under the camera for selfie monitoring. I'll come back to this later. But for the first time on any Nikon mirrorless, we also have a fill flash under the hot shoe. One thing I really love and appreciate about Nikon is their approach to consistency across camera models. Models. In other words, if you're familiar with one camera, chances are you could pick up a different model of Nikon and be pretty much familiar with the menu system where everything is, the form factor, the ergonomics, and the Z50 follows that same approach. Compared to the Z6, we have a smaller body, so there's a couple changes. First of all, we don't have the top viewfinder screen, and the mode selection switch has been moved over to the right-hand side of the camera. Now, the way the Z50 is set up is much like the Z6 and Z7. You have a switch that will toggle you between stills mode and video mode. What I love about this is it unlocks two different function sets completely. So for instance, let's say you're in stills mode and you're shooting, you switch over to video mode and you change your settings. You change your shutter speed down to give you a 180 degree shutter, maybe your ISO changes. When you go back to stills mode, it remembers all the settings that you were left off in. And the other thing that's really cool about is you have two user custom settings that actually become four because you have user one and user two in video mode, you have user one, user two in stills mode. This is a little bit of a cutback from the Z6 and Z7, which gave you three, but I still think two is enough 
enough and it gives you a lot of flexibility. On the back of the camera, we have a much more simplified user interface. There is no joystick and some of the buttons have actually been moved over onto the screen as touch buttons, which works just fine. I actually like having my magnification up higher because sometimes when I'm using manual focus, it's just easier to get to. The ports on the side of the camera have been reduced as well because of real estate. So for instance, we lost the remote and headphone jacks, but we did retain the mic jack and it is worth pointing out that the USB jack is not USB-C, it's USB-A. I kind of wish that was USB-C. The compartment on the bottom of the camera shares both the battery and the USB-C slot. The battery is a new battery which has been designed for this camera. This is the EL25 which is much smaller than the one you use in the Z6 and Z7. It's also worth noting that the card slot is a UHS-1 compatibility which is slower than UHS-2. I don't think it's a big problem on this camera because your top continuous frame speed shooting is 11 frames per second using the full megapixel readout. A quick word about the two lenses that were released with this camera. We have two DX lenses. The first is the Nikkor Z DX 16 to 50 millimeter f 3.5 to 6.3 VR. And then we have a longer lens, which is a Nikkor Z DX 50 to 250 millimeter f 4.5 to 6.3 VR. Now I'm going to be very honest once again, when I pulled these out of the box for the first time, I thought, well, you have two lenses that cost about $300. These are not great. They're just kit lenses that are going to come with the camera. They're for beginners or people who want an excellent focal length range. They don't necessarily need wide apertures. They don't have a lot of money to spend, but they are what they are. And actually, even like the longer lens, because they have VR built into them, there is kind of something loose in here when you're just carrying it around. It goes away once you turn the camera on and the VR starts. But I have to say, when I finally put these on the camera and started shooting, I was really impressed. I had to go back, look at the MTF charts. These are very sharp lenses. And considering the price point that you're going to get these at, they're not bokeh monsters by any stretch of the imagination. You can use the full frame Z lenses if you want a shallower depth of field. But for what these are, I think they're incredible. The VR is excellent in these. And because you don't have really wide apertures on either one of these lenses, especially once you start extending them out, that is going to be a problem. But I think the two best things I can say about this camera, one, the autofocus speed is still amazing. And two, the X-Speed 6 processor that's being used in here handles high ISO settings extremely well. Both of these lenses are actually extremely impressive, especially when you consider the price point. They're not going to win any design awards, but they perform really well, and I think you'd be happy with either one or both of these on this system. So let's talk about a few things that I love about the Z50 and a few things that I'm not too wild about. First thing is autofocus. It is outstanding. It supports IAF, especially when you're using the native DX lenses. It's extremely fast. Of course, these are not as wide an aperture, and that may have something to do with it, but even when you attach Z lenses that are designed for full frame, it does tend to feel a little bit snappier. I have no scientific way of measuring focus acquisition because it's all under a second, but it just feels a lot faster. Another thing I love about the lenses is the VR or vibration reduction is excellent, and you're going to need it because the camera does not have in-body image stabilization. Where you get digital stabilization for video, not a big fan, but the vibration reduction VR is excellent. I'm also really impressed with the X-Speed 6 image processor. I was impressed with it in the Z6 and the Z7, and it really shines on an APS-C camera as well. Now, every time that Nikon does a new version of the X-Speed processor, it is reprogrammed to handle a lot of things in terms of efficiency and high ISO performance, and it really is good in this camera. I think the pairing with a 20 megapixel sensor, it's a little bit lower than a 24, obviously, but it gives you a little more breathing room in the sensor being backside illuminated. It just handles really well with low noise at high ISO settings. It's kind of funny to me to remember back when 3200 ISO was a big feat. If you could get a camera that had a clean image at 3200, it was amazing. And usually you had to have a full frame camera for that to happen at all. And now that we can get much higher ISO settings on an APS-C or DX sensor, it's pretty amazing. And finally, the size. Nikon set out to make a smaller camera that was a little more portable, a little bit more carry around. Mission accomplished. There are a few things though that I would like to see changed in future models. First of all, the flippy screen flips down, which goes where the tripod goes. If you're filming a YouTube video on this, it's really kind of annoying. I don't know what the problem is with all the camera companies that don't want to just flip it out like Canon and Panasonic do. It really is the only way to go. It gives you a lot more options in terms of range, even if you're not filming video or filming yourself, if you're doing landscapes. I don't know. I'm just not a big fan of the flip down. Another issue that I wish could be addressed, and this is not only with Nikon, it's pretty much across the board with all APS-C mirrorless cameras. I wish the EVF were bigger. It's really hard to see on a small EVF, especially when you're trying to do critical focus. You can zoom in on the rear finder, but if you're shooting street 
photography, if you're using manual lenses, it just makes it really difficult. Now, this was a thing with DSLRs because you had the physics of the mirror involved and the size of the lens and the sensor. But with mirrorless cameras, we can project a different EVF in if we want. And I just wish this were bigger. I know they're trying to keep costs down. And like I said, this is not only applicable to Nikon. Sony has this problem as well as Canon. Everyone does. But I just wish we had bigger EVFs. Another issue I wish could be addressed, and I know it's hard to do with a smaller form factor, but there is no in-body image stabilization. As I mentioned earlier, the vibration reduction on the lenses is excellent on the two native lenses, but what if I want to use a full-frame Z-series lens like the 50 millimeter or the 35? Those don't have vibration reduction, so that's going to be more difficult. And also, sometimes it's fun to attach old manual focus Nikon lenses to these. And once again, you're going to have to be really steady or use a tripod, and it just reduces a lot of what you're able to do with this camera without IBIS. And finally, and I know this is super picky, but there is no in-log or log profile for video footage on here. This is something I wish they could work out. It probably has something to do with the fact that in-log is a 10-bit profile and this camera is just not capable of producing 10-bit video. I'm not really sure, but other APS-C sized cameras like Sony or even Fuji still find ways to put in log video. And so the problem that with Nikon is that I love the way the video looks on here, but some of the standard picture profiles are just too contrasty. They're too heavy handed. So if you shoot in log, this allows you to handle that in post. Once again, I know it's super nitpicky, but the competition has it. So I think Nikon should find a way to have that too. Most of all, I love this camera. I think it's got a lot of great things going forward. If you look at who Nikon are aiming this for, I think it could easily be a great first camera for somebody who's a beginner, but it also makes a great, just small carry around, more portable camera for somebody who's already invested in the Z system. So I think they've done an excellent job with this. Like I said, I didn't expect to be blown away by this camera. I'm actually very impressed for something that's this small that you can just carry around. The image quality is outstanding and it's fast. It's good in low light. I give this a definite thumbs up. So I would love to hear what you guys think. So drop me a comment below. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Until then, later.